Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Climbing on top of a rocket is still actually really nutty when you stop and think about it. I mean, you're literally riding a controlled explosion, sitting on top of a column of flames until the blue sky turns black. And because of this risky nature, it's generally considered a good idea to have a backup in case things go wrong. Welcome to Launch Abort Systems. Most human-rated vehicles have some type of system to get crew away from a failing rocket in a hurry, typically by pulling the crew capsule off of the rocket with a special set of abort motors. But did you know that the United States' second crew capsule, the Gemini spacecraft, had an interesting solution for getting crew away from impending doom? An ejection seat. Well, today we're gonna to take a look at an engineering solution to a problem that in hindsight would have almost certainly led to death. Oh, and there's actually a lot more to it than just the fact that they used an ejection seat. That's only part of the equation. This one's actually a pretty big face palm. So uh, welcome to our first episode of Biggest Face Palms of Spaceflight History. Three, two, one, The Gemini spacecraft was certainly an important step in American spaceflight history. I mean, after all, it was the first capsule to fit more than one astronaut, the first capsule to rendezvous, and the first capsule that U.S. astronauts did a spacewalk from. But despite all of its greatness, there is one thing clearly missing. A launch abort tower. I mean, after all, the Mercury capsule which flew right before Gemini had its own launch abort tower. So now before we get into why aborting from the Gemini would have almost certainly killed you, Let's talk about why they thought an ejection seat was good enough in the first place. There's three main reasons, and the first one is actually pretty counterintuitive. The Gemini launched on top of a Titan rocket, which used hypergolic propellants. And hypergolic propellants are ones that will ignite spontaneously upon mixing with each other. They're also insanely toxic, corrosive, and carcinogenic. I mean, there's a reason you have to wear this in order to handle these. I mean, you can die if you just breathe it in. But something that's kind of surprising is due to the fact that they ignite on contact, if a propellant tank ruptures, the energy of the blast and fireball would actually be a lot less energetic than, say, cryogenic fuels, which means less of a need to remain inside the protective capsule during an abort. The next reason why they thought it was good enough is because Gemini's chief designer, Jim Chamberlain, really didn't like big, bulky, and heavy launch abort towers. After all, he actually wanted the Gemini capsule to be modular, and he even envisioned it landing on the moon. In order to keep the system as simple and expandable as possible, he fought to use ejection seats instead of the launch abort tower. Now, this is one of those things that sort of confuses me, because, you know, the additional weight of a launch abort tower can be offset because it's typically ditched only a few minutes into ascent. Unlike ejection seats, whose weight would have to be lugged around throughout the entire portion of the flight. But the last reason why they opted to use ejection seats in the first place is easily my favorite reason. They originally planned for the Gemini capsule to land on a runway using a regalo wing, which was a self-inflating flexible wing. And now if something were to go wrong during this final landing phase, the astronauts could just simply eject just like a fighter pilot would. Unfortunately, the wing ended up being canceled and replaced with simple parachutes after it was unreliable to deploy, and even if it did deploy, it was really hard to control. If you want to know more about that crazy regalo wing and its use in the Gemini program, my friend Amy Shear Title has an awesome video all about it. I mean, after all, she wrote her master's thesis on it and even has a regalo wing tattooed on her arm. Okay, so now that we know why they went with an ejection seat, Let's talk about why you really, really didn't want to use it. First off, even when everything goes as planned with an ejection seat, they're unbelievably violent. I mean, so much so there's actually been cases of people breaking their backs. Okay, but broken backs is a better option than dying in a fiery explosion. So let's go down the list of other potential problems with an ejection seat. One risk was actually witnessed by John Young and Gus Grissom, who watched a test of the ejection seat system. The hatch failed to open, and the seat and the dummy punched right through the hatch. John Young, who, in my opinion, was easily one of the funniest astronauts ever, turned to Gus Grissom and said, that's a hell of a headache, but a short one. Next, say you do make it clear of the hatch, and you've ejected clean from on top of a 33 meter tall rocket. Well, if the rocket happens to erupt while you're in the air or parachuting down, kind of seems like you'd be showered in shrapnel, and if you survive that, you'll be walking through a toxic, corrosive, and cancerous wasteland to get to safety. Despite my objections and why this all sounds kind of like a terrible idea, it actually went through a solid three-year testing period by NASA, who found it to be quite safe and a good, reliable option up to about 15 kilometers in altitude. 
but after that it's uh yeah it's no good but lastly, perhaps the most face palmy and easily the most dangerous aspect of aborting from a Gemini capsule is something that went unnoticed until after the program ended. When NASA tested the ejection seats, they filled the capsules full of nitrogen. Well, that's great and all, except for the fact that the Gemini's cabin was a pure oxygen environment. Hmm, do you see where this is going? Had the astronauts needed to abort, they would have been soaking in a pure oxygen environment for hours, and upon lighting the rocket motors to eject, they would have likely immediately erupted into flames. I think Thomas Stafford said it best. I'm glad he didn't. Given that we'd been soaking in pure oxygen for two hours, any spark, especially the ignition of an ejection seat rocket, would have set us on fire. We'd have been two Roman candles shooting off into the sand and the palmetto trees. And of course, hindsight is 2020, and this was all before the unfortunate lessons learned during the Apollo 1 fire. But still, you have to think this was very much overlooked. But I guess when you're in a space race, it's probably really easy to overlook things when you're in such a hurry. Luckily, no one ever pulled the ejection handle on any Gemini mission, although the crew of Gemini 6 was literally fractions of a second away from pulling the handle. On December 12th, 1965, Wally Schirra and Thomas Stafford sat in their Gemini spacecraft waiting for Gemini 7 to fly overhead for the first orbital rendezvous attempt. All went really well up to engine ignition. The engines ran for 1.5 seconds and then abruptly shut down, which luckily for the crew, the rocket hadn't quite left the pad yet. If it had left the pad, it would have most likely fallen straight back down and would have probably exploded. Since the engines were running, the clock inside the capsule started running too, and the mission rules actually dictated that the commander, Wally Shira, was supposed to pull the D-ring that would have ejected both him and Thomas Stafford. His instincts made him hold back on ejecting since he didn't feel any acceleration yet. Since they hadn't left the pad, they were actually perfectly safe. Thanks to his quick gut reaction, he most likely saved Thomas Stafford and his own life. But then they had to sit there and wait on top of the rocket for 90 minutes before the area was safe. Man, I'll bet they were really happy to get down after that. NASA reset Gemini 6, the rocket was checked out, and then three days later it successfully launched and later made the first successful rendezvous. Well, the Soviets did actually rendezvous, but they didn't come this close. So yeah, come on. I mean, they were beating the United States so bad. Can't they just have it? Oh, and by the way, before we wrap up, did you know the Gemini spacecraft isn't the only space launch vehicle to have ejection seats? That's right, there's actually two other really famous spaceships that had ejection seats. NASA actually put ejection seats on the space shuttle. Space Shuttle Columbia's first four flights had ejection seats, which were deactivated by the fifth flight and later removed, freeing up a bunch of space on the flight deck. Since there was such a limited use case, considering it was super dangerous with those crazy SRB exhaust plumes, the angled main engine exhaust plumes, and the fact that only two of a possible eight crew members could eject, it was ditched. And unfortunately, they really couldn't add a bunch of ejection seats for the other crew members since half the crew was on the mid deck, which was below the flight deck, meaning they'd smack right into the flight deck's floor. Luckily, the space shuttle's ejection seats were never used. But did you know the Vostok capsule, which was the Soviet Union's first crew capsule, actually required the use of an ejection seat in order to have a successful mission? After re-entry, Vostok would land extremely rough and would have caused serious injuries to the cosmonaut on board. The cosmonaut would actually need to eject at 7 kilometers and parachute down to safety. The ejection seat also functioned as a launch abort system, although it wouldn't have worked within the first 20 seconds of flight as it didn't allow for enough time for the parachutes to deploy. As a shoddy attempt to remedy this, the Soviets actually put up safety nets around the launch pad in case the cosmonaut needed to eject. Yikes. Ejection seats worked fine on all six Vostok missions since the Soviets used a mixed atmosphere of nitrogen and oxygen inside the Vostok, meaning the cosmonauts didn't turn into Roman candles. Thank goodness. So what do you think? Do you think ejection seats was actually a valid option for an abort? Or do you think NASA really dodged a bullet by even allowing them in the first place? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And definitely stick around because we have a lot more really good face palms of spaceflight history to get to. And I owe a huge thanks to my Patreon supporters for helping me do all of this stuff. If you want to help contribute, please head on over to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. And while you're online, be sure and check out my brand new web store for shirts, hats, prints, Gridfin coasters, little moon lamps, 
lots of other fun stuff, including all the music in all my videos. Just go to everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Speaking of music, have you checked out my new three song EP called 27 Merlins, where I took the actual sequence of events of the Falcon Heavy test flight and I wrote music to it. That's right, when you watch that video, the video has not been edited in any way. The music was actually written to the video. So it's a fun new way to experience the Falcon Heavy launch again. So be sure and check it out and share it with a friend. Thanks everybody, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.